Welcome to the Introduction to Criminal Liability. The Introduction to the Introduction to Criminal Liability. Uh, this program is designed as one part of an introduction to the law. The information and legal situations presented are used to help introduce the legal system only and should not be taken as legal advice. While the general principles mentioned were put forth by various courts, these courts have also included a number of exceptions and changes that have not been included. All legal questions should be directed to an attorney for legal advice. As they say, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, so uh, live dangerously if you want to, but don't say I didn't warn you. This class also focuses primarily on Maryland and United States federal law. Other states have their own laws, and many of them differ significantly from Maryland's. Other countries have their own laws, and many of them differ significantly from the United States of America. Before dealing with another locale, research their laws. Legal questions should be directed to an attorney practicing in that jurisdiction. Alright, finally, I'm going to use the word digital a lot. It's not a perfect label. Uh, there's quantum computing, etc., etc., but I have to call it the computery stuff something. I'm going with digital. Eh, it could be worse. So what is criminal liability? Well, criminal law is one of two broad categories of law that deals with acts which, in a sense, are offenses against us all. Now, I say in a sense because, as you're aware, certain crimes have victims. But it's not the victim that's bringing the case. It is the government. The government is bringing the case on behalf of the people. And the reason for this is by committing a crime, you violated the law, you violated the rules that we as a, a country or a state, a government, a city, etc., have decided everyone's going to follow, and therefore it is the government that is the prosecuting party. Now, in a criminal case, the standard of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt, which is a very, very high standard. And the reason for that is the court can impose a sentence of imprisonment, a fine, restitution, or any other punishment that is related to the criminal act. In certain jurisdictions, the death penalty is an option for severe crimes. Uh, Maryland is not one of those jurisdictions. So what is criminal liability in the digital context? Well, you have all of traditional liability, what Judge Easterbrook would refer to as the law of the horse. Uh, you also have liability that's unique to the digital context that goes beyond what has been traditional. Uh, now, Traditional liabilities generally consists or generally is broken down into your crimes against persons, your crimes against property, your crimes against the public. And as the word traditional suggests, these crimes have been around for a very long time, hundreds of years, thousands of years, etc. Now, some of this traditional liability uh, includes things like murder, robbery, assault, sex offenses, and we group these into what we refer to as crimes against persons, something where say, an, an individual is directly harmed or threatened with harm. You also have your crimes against property, burglary, theft, forgery, malicious destruction. These are cases where a victim is not directly harmed, but their property interest is. And then you have your crimes against the public, things like child pornography, interference with the government, interference with public services. And these are all things that where the public sensibilities or public efficiency are in some way affected. Now, obviously, this is not a complete list, just a few examples of traditional liability. Uh, let's just move on. If these crimes have been around for hundreds of years or thousands of years, what does this have to do with digital forensics? Well, you can now use technology to commit nearly all of these traditional crimes. I'm going to be referring to this as traditional liability using a digital medium. Uh, medium just means using one thing to do something else. Digital is the thing that we're using, and traditional liability is the thing to, that we're trying to accomplish. So you can use a computer to murder someone. You can use a computer to steal from someone, even though you can also murder people and steal from people in person. In addition, evidence of these traditional crimes can be found in digital form. That is digital evidence of traditional liability. So just as there are fingerprints, uh, the old style of digital evidence, uh, that you can find at a crime scene, you can also use uh, computers in order to find uh, evidence of crime, of traditional liability. But at a certain point, we leave traditional liability and we head somewhere new. So if you're traditional liability, the law of the horse, the law that applies to every other category. Uh, but then you have things that are more unique than that, things that do not exist in real life. 
Now, some crimes did not exist at common law and do not exist outside of the digital realm. Uh, so they can't just say that, oh, it's the law of the horse, it's just like everything else applied to a new medium, because they only exist in this one place. Now, there are analogies, there are things like trespass or burglary, breaking and entering, that are analogous perhaps to hacking, but there are other digital laws, there are other laws that are uh, unique to the digital context. Uh, you have your CAN spam act. I, I don't know why I started with that one. Uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. You have the Unlawful Access to Stored Communications Act. Illegal Access, which is the state version of the Unlawful Access to Stored Communications. Electronic Harassment, which clearly you can't do without a computer. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Digital. Uh, and a bunch of others. There are also things like the wiretap statutes, which have their own electronic communication provision. This is just a partial list. This is not a comprehensive list. It's just a few examples. So where does criminal law come from? Well, criminal law comes from two sources. It comes from the common law and it comes from statutory law. And yes, as you can clearly see, this is a picture of Orville Redenbacher questioning Diane from Cheers in front of Judge Sean Connery. That was, that was terrible. Sean Connor, whatever. Can't do accents. Anyway, what is the common law? That is the source, that is one of our two sources of criminal law. Well, the common law is the law that we brought over from England when we declared our independence. So on July 3rd, 1776, there were laws. And on July 4th, 1776, when we declared our independence, it was not suddenly anarchy. Uh, we brought law over from England. Uh, everything except for that whole part about the king, uh, that's, that's, what you might consider the common law. Statutory law is, is your schoolhouse rock law. Uh, it is the laws that are passed by the legislature, the bills that are passed by the legislature, signed into law by the executive, or there's a veto that gets overridden. Uh, the point is that it's all the statutes that are passed by the legislature that are still on the books. When I say still on the books, I mean that the legislature or the judicial branch hasn't stricken um, and replaced with something else or replaced with nothing. So everything that is currently valid on the books, we refer to as statutes. Now, federal criminal law only comes from statutes. There is no federal common law. The, I mean, obviously there are traditions that were brought over, etc. There's a history, there are reasons that we enacted certain statutes, but there is no direct connection between English law and federal law. It is wholly statutory. Maryland, on the other hand, has in its constitution a specific provision that, is in, that entitles the people of Maryland to the common law of England, except for the things that are modified by the legislature and the things that are modified by the legislature referred to as statutes. So Maryland not only has a common law, we have a constitutional right to it under our state constitution. In addition to that, we have statutory law, uh, which are the bills that are passed by the Maryland General Assembly. Now, Baltimore City does not have that rich tradition. We do not have common law uh, city crime. Uh, we have, however, Baltimore City ordinances. We have Baltimore City statutory law. So, uh, looking at the list of liability sources that we were looking at last time, uh, you have your executive regulations, your le legislative statutes, you have your judicial opinions and the common law. Uh, the only ones we really care about are the legislative statutes, and the common law. Those are the only two sources of criminal law, of new criminal law. Obviously, uh, judicial opinions and executive regulations, uh, decisions of executive agencies, impact the criminal justice system. But if we're just talking about what is against the law, the sources for that are going to be your statutes and the common law. So tune in next time for statutory interpretation, where we look at how you can find these statutes, break them down, and understand them. See you next time.